Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. I am your host, Steve Bissam. I'm an author and mental health counselor. Are you curious about therapy? Do you feel there is a lot of mystery about therapy? Do you wonder what your therapist is doing and why? The goal of this podcast is to make therapy and psychology accessible to all by using real language and straight-to-the-point discussions. This podcast wants to remind you to take care of your mental health, just like you would your physical health. Therapy should not be intimidating. It should be a great way to better health. I will demystify what happens in counseling, discuss topics related to mental health, and discussions you can have with your therapist. I also want to introduce psychology in everyday life, as I feel most of our lives are enmeshed in psychology. I want to introduce the subtle and not-so-subtle ways psychology plays a factor in our lives. It will be my own mix of thoughts as well as special guests. So join me on this discovery of therapy and psychology. Hi, and welcome to episode 34 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. My name is Steve Bisson. If you haven't listened to episode 33 yet, please do so. It was a discussion in regards to harmful use of diagnosis on social media. I've been very concerned about that for a while, so hopefully you listen to that episode you really enjoy it. But episode 34 will be with Crystal Partney. Crystal Partney is an author, speaker, and suicide grief coach and founder of Scattering Hope and Owl and Tissel. She's also the host of the upcoming You Are Loved podcast. After losing her sister on the day before her birthday from suicide, Crystal is hoping to continue to open the dialogue in regards to suicide and mental health in general. And I really hope that it goes well. I actually, a side story. I met Crystal online on one of those, you know, Zoom meetings on something else. And then we met in San Diego by accident at a conference that we were both attending. And I really have enjoyed talking to Crystal during that time. And I'm hoping that that shows up in the interview. So here is the interview with Crystal. Hi, and welcome to episode 34 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. You know, it's interesting. You meet people differently throughout your, your career and your life. And I met Crystal online for the first time when we were going through a podcast kind of like thing with Steve Olsher. And then we went to a, I guess it was more of a get together. I don't know what to call it, but to get more information on how to get a podcast going. And we met in San Diego also for the first time face to face. And I just love Crystal's story. I just enjoyed it so much. So I wanted to invite Crystal to my podcast. So Crystal Partney, welcome. Thank you. (laughs) Crystal, I, I, I don't want to share too much with the audience what I, what I know about why I found it so interesting. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself at this point. Sure. So my story really began the day before my birthday. In 2019, I received a phone call from my mother that morning that my sister Gina had taken her life. And after that, I just, I just needed next steps. I didn't know how to begin to heal. I obviously have experienced tremendous loss in my life, but to lose someone to suicide was a whole new ball game. And I honestly didn't know how to react. I didn't know how to process it. And it was such a shock not just to me, but to my whole family in general. And that's, that's really where my story begins. What's your sister's name? Gina. And I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. You know, it's it, it, one of the hardest things to do is to figure out suicide. It's such a thing that's very difficult to understand for so many people. Obviously, very shocking to lose your sister. Was she younger or older? Yeah, she was my oldest sister. And kind of like losing that older sister and then having right before your birthday. Right. Is just, how did you feel that day? I mean, how how do you process that? How did this is so difficult for so many people? It wasn't easy. That's for sure. My, like I said, excuse me, when my mom called me, I was expecting her to, you know, just ask me, about my day, asked me about how, you know, what I was planning for my birthday the next day. So to have her call wasn't anything unusual because we talk on the phone practically every day. (laughs) So 
for her to call was nothing new. But as soon as I picked up the phone, I knew that something was terribly wrong because I could just hear it in her voice. She didn't even have to say anything. I could just, I could just feel it. And that day was just a complete whirlwind. My little girl was three at that time. Her birthday is the end of January. And so I was then faced with the difficult decision. How do I tell my three-year-old that her aunt Gina has died? Let alone, how do I explain to a three-year-old about suicide? (laughs) And what do I disclose? And how do I have that conversation with her? Because she's so little. And I felt like me and my husband handled it really well. And to be like fully transparent, we were just open. I I didn't go into details, but it was just a beautiful moment that I shared with, with me and my daughter. And if you'd like, I'll share it with you, but please do. But yeah. So it was several days after my sister's passing and I wrestled with the idea, as you can imagine, of telling her, okay, what do I share? How do I share it? And she knew something was up. And that's the the beautiful thing about having kids that age is they're very much aware. They're very attuned to their surroundings. They know something has gone terribly wrong. They just don't know what. So I was in the bathroom and my little girl came in and she goes, mommy, why are you crying? You've been crying a lot. Why are you even crying? And so without, you know, talking to my husband first, but I, you know, inadvertently said, Hey, we need to say something to her. So I just took that moment and said, honey, I've been crying because, you know, aunt Gina has died. And she looked at me and she goes, why? And I said, well, honey, I don't know why. I said, she was just really sad. And then it's, it's so interesting because she then looked at me and she started to smile. And I said to her literally, honey, why are you smiling? And she goes, well, does that mean she's with grandpa Lanny? And that's my dad. And she never got the opportunity to meet my dad, but because, because he passed away before she was born, but we talk about him all the time. And so she goes, as, as, does that mean she's with grandpa Lanny? And I said, yes, honey. And she says, okay. And she ran out of the bathroom and it was so, it was kind of comical because it was like, oh, that went better than I expected. (laughs) (laughs) not that I could plan for these things, but, but it was like, oh, oh, she handled that far better than I anticipated. And, and for her, that's all she needed. It was just so much comfort and peace to me at that moment that it was like, oh, okay. So she doesn't need to know the details. She just needs to know that she's in good company that she's with, you know, my dad and other loved ones that have passed on and that's enough for her. And that should be enough for me. And of course, like we're both, all of us are tremendously sad, but to have it be (laughs) vocalized from a three-year-old, it was like, oh, okay. I get it. I get it. And it was beautiful. You know, I have a tear in my eye, just listening to your story and it's a little bit of the stuff that I think is so important for so many people having some sort of spiritual life, whatever that is. And again, you know, whether it's, you know, with your father or whatever spiritual life people believe in, which is fine. I always tell people how important spiritual life is to your own mental health and how to deal with difficulties. Because if you not having a spiritual life is probably the most difficult thing to not have when you're going through a whole lot. I know that we're going to be shifting a little bit here, but you talked about how your daughter dealt with it and you did brilliant as a parent. I got to tell you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> that was planned. No, not really. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you read the, you read the book on it. I'm assuming. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the, the book that came out, you know, when she was born, there's a manual and all that. Right. Stuff. Exactly. That manual was fabulous, by the way. 
Yes. I, I, if I can get my hands on it, please let me know. But I, I wonder how also for you as you lose your sister and how did you deal with all that? Because not only is it hard because you have a young daughter, but it's also dealing with your own loss because it's your sister. Yeah. Well, like I have shared just a minute ago, it wasn't easy. I was literally graduating. I was in my senior year of college about a month away from graduating. So as you can imagine, not that there's any perfect timing to hear this this tragedy, but it came at such a time where I was like, oh my goodness, okay. Now I'm faced with the decision, do I even graduate? And I really had to sit with that and say, what would my sister want for me in this moment? And my sister knew like, the, you know, blood, sweat, and tears of just getting to that point where it was like, okay, I see that I'm graduating in a month. And I had to just ask, and I honestly, I had to ask her too, and just ask her verbally and say, Gina, what would you want? I know you would want me to graduate. Is this what you want? And it was a definite yes. Like, I want you to graduate. And then you can work out the details later. And so that's what I did. I was very fortunate to graduate. And it didn't matter about grades at that point. I just graduated. I bet. And I told myself that I was going to take a year off. And I was very fortunate. I didn't have to like rush out and find a job in the field that I had just graduated. I could really, you know, just take my time and just heal. And so that's what I did. But it's interestingly enough you know, we talked about the spiritual aspect of it. After it hit me and we went on a graduation trip to San Diego, of all places, actually. (laughs) (laughs) And my mom and my husband and daughter, you know, we all celebrated and, and I wanted my mom to come and she did. And we had a fabulous time. And, but I gotta be honest, that's really when it hit me that my sister was gone. Because I felt like up until that point, you know, you're just going through the motions and you're just like, graduate, graduate, graduate. Right. And, you know, turn in this paper, do this test, go to work, I'll fill all the blanks. And be a mom. And then, and then when we were on my trip, it was like the noise just got stopped and it was quiet. And that's when it was like, oh, wow. Okay, this is real this is real and, and raw too. And, and not, again, just not just for me, but for my whole family, for my mom. And it was, it was extremely difficult. And I want to always tell people that that first year, you've got to be able to ebb and flow. You can't go at the pace that you were going at before. And you can't, continuously like beat yourself up over what has happened you know because it's so easy to get in your head and be like well I could have done this or I should have done this and you really have to take a stand back and say I did the best I could with the circumstance I did the best I could with where I was at and I have to give myself grace (laughs) because at the end of the day again I keep referring back to my sister because I'm constantly asking her like, okay, Gina, I know that you would not want me to keep reminiscing and holding this unattainable like standard to myself. I, she would want me to begin healing, whatever that looked like for me. And just again, bringing that grace into your life is so key. Well, I think that when you go through the grieving process, there's Kubel Ross's stages of grief that everyone knows about. And as I, some people have said it's been debunked. I don't necessarily agree with that. I do believe there's no order to it. I mean, the disbelief, the depression, the anger, the bargaining, and the acceptance, they happen in different Right. They and happen in waves. And they'll happen again over and over. I I think until we pass away, frankly, 
because it's, you know, you can accept something that doesn't mean the anger is taken care of. I don't think that the bargaining is taken care of necessarily. We still think about these things and the ebb and flow. I think that's great advice for the first year, just being able to adapt is, you know, and respecting yourself. I mean, therapists and a lot of people talk about self-care, but being able to be just caring for yourself. I mean, there's a difference between the two, in my opinion, being able to care for yourself and giving yourself a break is so important. So I think that that's where you did really good with the ebb and flow. And I really like the, you know, how it hit you at a different time. We're talking about what a four month period that it hit you. Yeah, I would say, you know, definitely within, you know, after graduating and then after the date, we immediately went on vacation and it was that, that period of vacation and, and, you know, winding down and coming back from the vacation. That's really, I would say, yeah, that's pretty accurate. The, the four month span, but again, it was a continuum it wasn't like, Hey, I'm good, <laughs> but it's interesting because everybody's journey is unique in the, in the healing process and the grieving process, because I have family members that they just immediately went back to work and it was like, no big deal, <laughs> but I knew that they were hurting. They just had a different way of showing it. And so again, it's so personal and there's no right or wrong way, but as long as you begin, because it's so easy to just push it off and be like, nope, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to, I'm fine. Like, you know, the classic phrase, I'm fine. It's like, uh, bull crap. Right. <laughs> You're not fine, but that's okay. If that's the front you want to put up, that's, that's your choice. But I would just encourage anybody that if they're in that situation and they find themselves wanting to push it off because it is hard and it is difficult and it's going to bring up a wave of emotions to learn to embrace it rather than resist it. Because in the moments when I did resist it, oh my goodness, Steve, it came back like tenfold. <laughs> and can I just say that the least opportune moment, like, oh, I'm at the grocery store and I'm like sobbing in the cereal aisle not the best time, but Hey. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately we don't have any control over that either. No. So, you know, just a reminder, we're listening to finding your way through therapy. I'm sitting here with Crystal Partney. My name is Steve Biso. One of the things that I really, I think we related to so many different things off air, obviously, and want to say, you know, like having lost my best friend when I was 12 and really not processing it till I was 16. It was a weird situation for me to deal with that 1980s much different time than today so obviously that's giving away my age therapy wasn't offered to me obviously and that's not because anyone is bad it wasn't it wasn't the, the zeitgeist of the times we didn't really think about that stuff did you end up going to counseling going to therapy or anything like that yeah absolutely and in fact that was one of the the request that my mother had was as soon as this tragedy occurred, we as a family decided, okay, me and my, my other sister decided, okay, now is the time that mom really needs to begin to process this and go to therapy. We had encouraged her to go long before my sister's passing, but when, you know, my, my dad passed away and we were encouraging her then. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And then when my sister had passed away, it was like, okay, no, <laughs> this is the, this is the final straw. Like we, we need you to go. And she very lovingly asked if I would go with her. She said, I'll go, but I want you to go with me. And I said, that's fine. I, I will go. And to be fully transparent, we still go, we still go even to this day. And it's not obviously as frequently as it was in the beginning, but I found it tremendously helpful because there was this third party that could speak into our story and speak into the problems that we were having, the, the circumstances, and just in general. And it's interesting because when I reached out to this 
this therapist that was referred to us, I, I kind of felt like, well, in my mind, this tragedy has already occurred. So it's too late. And it was just interesting because the therapist was like, no, like I need you in here next week. <laughs> <laughs> like they were very adamant, like, no, I need you in here next week. Like, can you come next week? Great. And, and it just kind of threw me off guard because in my mind it was like, well, it was too late, but not understanding. No, it's never too late. And that, you know, having someone to be adamant and saying, no, like now is the perfect time and let's get it started. Let's have you begin that healing process and having therapy as a again, it's like a tool belt, right? You're having another tool that you can refer to that is only going to help you. And it's for your benefit. I know that there's such a stigma there, but there really shouldn't be. There's, and I don't know why, (laughs) but I'm, yeah. Well, I think that we're still dealing with a whole lot of history in Westernized cultures and in America about something bad happened get your shit together and get back into whatever you're doing right you know, the, yeah the, the, go the back bar- to work do whatever distract yourself yeah yeah it's called, it's called burying it come on let's go and think that that's why like one of the biggest things that bereavement process is so important in my opinion is to you know as you said and i'm going to say in, in the therapeutic way i think that's just validating where you're at and being okay i mean you always feel strange because you know you're you're like okay i'm kind of feeling blank but you feel strange so the bereavement process with a family therapy or even an individual therapy is really helpful to be validated for how you feel and i don't know how you feel about that oh absolutely because it's interesting <laughs> because you know my my mom would share something in therapy session and then the the therapist would say well, is that true? <laughs> because <laughs> we, you know, we tend to be like, oh yeah, it's this way. But so it's pretty comical. It's like, okay, is that true? And it's like, well, yeah, is that's true or or nope, <laughs> you know. So it's nice to, it's nice to have a, a family member there too to just process everything. And you know, me and my mom have always been really close, and we were extremely close to my sister and. My sister, you know, lived with my mother and in the basement of my mom and dad's home. And so, so to say that they were close was, of course, <laughs> of course right. they were close. I'm just a big fan of therapy, obviously, as I do that for a living. But I also think that when you go through therapy, did you feel yourself any type of stigma for going to therapy for the loss of your sister? Like you said, I I think the words were, well, the tragedy already occurred. Why go to therapy? Was there a stigma that came in with that for you? Oh, absolutely. Because again, you know, suicide in general holds its own stigma. And then, and then you are, you're trying to, you know, grapple with what has happened and what's already occurred and of course like I had to deal with that in my own regard and just say like Crystal this is for my benefit this is for your benefit and what I also realized too when I had to share with my daughter that you know Angina has has died I realized in that moment Steve that it wasn't just me that I had a three-year-old that was looking to me in this very moment for that whenever she experiences a tragedy in her life, she's going to remember this moment and she's going to ask herself, well, how did mom handle it? Was she like a wreck? (laughs) Was she, you know, strong? Was she, did she ask for help? Did she receive help? That was the key because I got to be honest, I very struggled with like receiving the help from whether it was my husband or my daughter or outside other family members or friends. That was a struggle for me. But I just realized in that moment that, okay, this isn't about just me, but she's going to remember this and how I processed it. And I'm setting the bar for her so that whenever she does experience a tragedy, 
she's going to refer to this moment and notice I'm saying when, not if. <laughs> no, you, you don't think it's all over and you'll never have a tragedy until the end of your life? <laughs> <laughs> right. Wishful thinking, but no. <laughs> I, but I think that's that's good. I mean, you said it yourself, modeling the behavior is so important. And also kind of like saying that this is going to happen again. I think that there's a lot of people who like to think that, you know, this one tragedy and it's not going to be one tragedy. We all have losses. I mean, in life, that's just how it is. And knowing how to process it and feeling everything you said, you know, my daughter, did I bury it? Did I deny it? Did I deal with it? Did I go to therapy? Did I talk to her? I think it's not just one of those things. It's all of those things need to be addressed. And I think that therapy really helps with that. Just a final question. What do you think was the most helpful that your therapist did other than say, well, is that true? I mean, is there other things that you felt that the therapist really did well for you? Yeah, I would say one of the things that they continue to do is press further because it's easy for me and for, you know, my mom too, to kind of give like the, the blanket statement or the, the story but then to dig a little bit deeper and ask more questions was extremely helpful and is extremely helpful to the, the therapy process because, again, not realizing like, hey, there's, there's some underlining things that as I'm sharing just different stories or whatever the case may be, whether it's a conflict, there's always more to it. And so just having the, our therapist, you know, press a little bit further, even when it's hard and just be willing to ask more questions and, and dive a, a little deeper. Therapy is not necessarily comfortable. If it's too comfortable, it's probably not good. You know, I push my clients regularly and I always share the story. My former therapist, when I first met her, I did like 15 minutes with her and she looked at me after 15 minutes. She's like, all right, now that you've said all your therapist bullshit, are you going to tell me the real truth? And I remember going, wow, she called me right away on my stuff. And then <laughs> she, she, she gained my absolute respect. And I know that some people, I share that story when people feel uncomfortable about therapy and they say, it's okay to be uncomfortable in therapy. That's what it should be. Yeah. And maybe that's part of the stigma. But for me, it's like, let's lift the stigma by saying, yeah, it should be uncomfortable. You go to PT, it's not going to be comfortable. You're working back your way to different things. Right. So mental health's the same way. Let's shift gears a little bit because I, I, I really want to know more about what are your thoughts because you've been through your own therapy, you went through your loss. And, you know, this is so difficult, especially losing your sister, Gina. What would you tell someone after losing a loved one to suicide? What, what were your, would be your thoughts on that? My thoughts are just, there's always hope. I know that, especially for me, I felt alone and just trying to process it, even though I knew like mentally I'm not alone, but there was just this void that was missing. And quite frankly, I don't think we'll ever be filled because she took a piece of my heart. And so, but there's always hope and you don't need a lot of it. You only need a sliver of it. And I know that there are going to be really, really dark days ahead of you. And just know that when you're in those moments to look for the signs that they're there with you. Because one of the, one of the moments that was so profound was it was actually before my sister passed away. It was the, the Christmas that I shared with my family after, you know, my dad passed away. He passed away in April of 2013 and it was Christmas. And there, that was just a really tough year for me. I, I kind of coined that my year of hell because I, in January, I lost a nephew at uh, 39 weeks gestation and Jeez. then I lost my dad in April due to health complications and then I lost my best friend in December of that year 
to the same health complications. And I remember that Christmas and just, just sitting there mad. I was so mad. And I remember yelling and just being like, you guys should be here right now. Mm-hmm. You should be here. And I was extremely sad. And I got to say, it was such a, I, I felt this peace come over me. and. All is the whisper only said was, first of all, we're here. We're just not in the form that you want us to be in. And it was like, oh, you're right. I want you to be here physically. But in that moment, I realized they're still here. They're experiencing life with you. Make no mistake of it. They are here, they are with you in the ups, they are with you in the downs, and they're not going anywhere. And just, it brought me so much peace in that moment. And yes, of course, I was still mad. I was extremely sad, but it was like, okay, you're right. You're right. I want you here physically, but you're not. But again, you're still here. I just can't see you, but you're experiencing life with me. And I, it's kind of interesting because I always joke. I tell my sister, I'm like, okay, Gina, you're more than welcome to hang out with me, but I'm kind of boring. And if you're okay with that, then, <laughs> then you're more than welcome to stay. <laughs> so I'm glad I can still, you know, give her a laugh and she can give me a laugh. But I'm pretty sure she doesn't find you boring. Yeah. (laughs) I hope not. You know, it's, it's hard when someone, especially with suicide, it's so hard to understand. You had all that loss in 2013 and kind of remind people that we carry everyone's, you know, whether you want to call it your heart, your brain, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. I carry all the ones that I've lost through in my heart. And in spiritual ways in through everything. So it, it is maddening. It is sad. It is, it creates fear. There's so many emotions that go with that and just kind of normalizing that fact and losing someone to suicide. I wish I had a better explanation for any human being that comes through to my door or anyone who tells me about it. I don't have an explanation. I don't think anyone has an explanation and it's realizing that, all you can do is carry there in your heart, in your soul, in your spiritual life, you carry them with you. And I think that's a powerful statement you just made. Thank you. Yeah. And we all search for answers. And I know, especially with my sister, there was a letter, but I felt like, and I'm sure it's not just me, but my whole family, even though there were her, it's in her words, and this was this was her, you know, reasons, it doesn't make it any better. And so again, just using the constant reminder that they're here, that there's nothing that they will say will bring peace to your spirit, if that makes sense. I think that peace all comes from within. I mean, I did not know Gina, but obviously I think that she is in our interview right now. She may not, you know, whether whether people think that's too woo-woo for them, I don't really care. I think she's right here. She's part of you. She's part of our conversation. I'm happy to share that with the world too. So I'm, I'm happy that you're continuing to share her legacy and everything else with that. And we'll definitely get to that too. Why do you feel there's still a stigma around suicide, mental health, and all that stuff that's still going on and still prevalent across a lot of different places in this world right now? Well, like we had shared earlier, death in general is hard to process, but then you throw the word suicide in the mix and it's like, wow, okay. It just adds a whole another layer and and complexity to the situation and, and the loss and how I processed my sister's loss. It was different compared to my dad. 
and as it should be. Like, I just want right. to preface that by saying our relationship and our dynamics vastly different between both people and that's okay. That's normal. So why I think there's a stigma is there's the only thing that comes to my mind is fear. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of, well, I got to have all the answers. And if I don't have all the answers, I'm going to be, I'm going to look like a fool (laughs) rather than embracing that and saying, well, nobody has all the answers. (laughs) And that's a good thing. That means you're, you're open, you're willing to, you know, going back and receive the help. And you're willing to say, Hey, I'm not perfect. And I don't know what I'm doing. And so there's a, there's a level of honesty that comes alongside and, and helping break that stigma and saying, you know what, I need some help. I need some help. And I got to be honest, like even my sister was seeing a therapist and she was prescribed medication and then comes to find out that she stopped taking the medication. She stopped going to therapy. And, and I remember her vocalizing and saying, like, it's just not working. It's not working. I don't want to you know, spend the money. I, it's just not working. And I remember telling her, I was like, well, do you know, go, go find someone else. I was right. like, yeah, maybe that person's not great. Go find someone else. <laughs> as simplistic as that was. But you also have to be willing to accept the help. Right. You have to be able to say, especially to those people that you love, hey, I'm not well. This is going on and and these things have keep coming up and I really could use some help. And as a family, we were desperately trying to get my sister the help that she needed. And just she was unwilling to receive it at the end of the day. Yeah. And I mean, uh, just a reminder, we're listening to Finding Your Way Through Therapy, Crystal Partney, Steve Bisson here. You know, one, one of the things that it, it never really took me a long time, but I know some therapists have struggles with this. You know, I one of my first things I say when I meet new clients is, Listen, I'm not everyone's cup of tea and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The good news is there's a ton of other therapists that you can be referred to. So I, you don't like my style or what have you. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We'll try to find you someone that may be a better style, better, better fit, whatever the case may be. But I think there's also stigma around that too, because now we, I got to repeat my story and this and that. Well, maybe because you tell your story, you're taking away, you know, I'm going to bore you with neuro- neurological stuff here, but we have anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 thoughts in a day and they stay in your head and they're going to be all muffled and all screwed up. And a lot of the moments of aha in my therapy sessions are people just saying out loud what they're thinking. And they're like, oh, wow, that makes perfect sense. Oh, wow. Why was I even thinking that or what have you? But it just sometimes that insight, you need to have that third party who's only vested in you to listen to you and kind of validate and, or just listen to you. So I, I always encourage therapy for that way, but I think that it's hard sometimes to open up. And like I said, my therapist would have told you the same thing about me, but Hey, confidentiality, we can't talk about it. The hardest part for me too, as a therapist, even though I've, you know, obviously I've worked with people who've had suicide in their life. I've certainly lost clients to suicide it's hard to kind of start addressing that. And how do you bring that up? Maybe not even in therapy, but how do you bring that up to anyone? How do you talk about that stuff? For me, I, again, I have a lot of stories, but I realized just how important it was even before my sister passed away. So I'll just share this brief, brief example of how to begin talking about something as sensitive as suicide and if people are contemplating suicide. So my sister, she, you know, was newly divorced and her children were in their teenage years and they wanted to only live with their dad, which he doesn't live nearby. He lives about three hours away. And so 
my sister was a single mom and she would, you know, rarely see the kids. And when she would see the kids, you know, typical teenagers, they'd be on their phones and they wouldn't really be present. And I know that (laughs) that was a, a source of contention for my sister. Like we just, and I get it, you know, she's like, gosh, I don't understand. Like, I just want them to be present or I want them to do X, Y, Z. And they're not, they, they'd rather hang out with their friends. And, but I bring that up because so my sister, you know, she was newly divorced and we were celebrating Christmas and I was out Christmas shopping for my family and I knew my sister was struggling and I came across this beautiful wooden sign. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get that for Gina. And so I did. And for those of you that don't know, I come from a very large family. I'm the youngest of eight. And so as you can imagine, there's no way I can buy Christmas gifts for all of my family members, let alone their spouses and their kids and anybody would go broke. I'm just saying. But, uh, you know, I saw this and I was like, yep, I need, I need to get this for Gina. So I got home and it was just right before Christmas. And I went over to my mom and dad's home and, and I went downstairs in the basement and I said, Gina, I got you a Christmas gift. And she was like, what? You got me a Christmas gift? And I was like, yes, I know. I know it's not our thing because, you know. It's not in the budget or whatever, but I got you this because I thought of you as soon as I saw it and she unwrapped it and she started to cry and the sign, the, the wooden sign, what it says on it is find your happy. Mm. And I took that moment and I just looked at her and said, Gina, I don't know what you're going through. And I just wanted to let you know that I see you. I see you. I see the struggles you're going through. And I don't know what it's like to be newly divorced and have your kids choose to live three hours away. I don't know what that's like. And I can't even imagine what it's like as a mother to have that decision be placed on you. And, you know, just the notion of, of starting over again and, after, you know, decades of being married. And I don't know what that's like, but I just wanted to let you know that I see you and I truly do want you to find your happy. And like I said, in that moment, she was crying. And and I think that was the realization for me that it's as simple as that. Just simply having the conversation with the people that we care and love about and, and care about and just saying, I see you. I see the struggles you're going through. And and even if they're not visually, like I could see the struggles that my sister was going through. And oftentimes they keep it hidden, but just simply having the conversation with them and just say, you know what, I, we haven't talked in so long and I just want to check in and see how you're doing. And, and, you know, tell me how you're doing, tell me about your day and just begin that conversation. And, and you might have to be blunt and say, I got to, ask a very sensitive question, but have you ever thought of taking your life? And if they're like, yes, or if they're not, if they're not going to be open, it's fine. But just the fact that you're willing to have that conversation with someone can speak volumes. And especially what I realized in that moment with my sister was, oh my goodness, all it takes is a conversation and it doesn't have to be difficult doesn't even have to be uncomfortable. It can just be as simple as saying that I, I see you and I love you. And sometimes people who are in that suicidal thought process, they just don't feel love. They feel alone. One of the things that the the biggest thing I, I learned when I started my career, I worked on a crisis team is that in fact, asking about suicide creates a situation where they're less likely to commit suicide because you brought it up. You know, most people are like, no, you gave them the idea. No, they probably already had the idea. So might as well just put it out there and kind of like be able to have that co- that hard conversation. Not an easy thing to do, but you're absolutely right. You got to bring it up. Well, and it becomes this, 
sort of breath of fresh air. Like, oh, okay. I was like struggling with this all internally. And the fact that you just came out and said it, and it's just asked, like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. And you need to ask, I think. And it's such a difficult thing to do. Um, you know, approaching our loved ones with those thoughts and those conversations probably shows more care than not bringing it up. Right. So do you suggest any other ways of bringing it up to someone just kind of like being as honest if, you know, or do you have any other ideas around that? Yeah. Especially when it comes to like teenagers, <laughs> I was, you know, thinking about this and even after experiencing this beautiful moment with my sister and just realizing like, okay, we're just going to have the conversation and just, even, you know, taking them out to dinner or whatever it is that you guys like to do together and just have the conversation and just be willing to say, have you ever thought about this? And if so, like, just be open. And, and just the fact that you're willing to have the conversation with them is going to be such a breath of fresh air for them and for you. Because quite frankly, I didn't realize this until recently. But when I, growing up, like talking about suicide, it was, it was kind of uncommon. And maybe it was just because I didn't experience that until I was, you know, around 16, I lost a, a childhood friend. The yeah, aforementioned stigma was real and continues yeah. to be real. So please continue. I'm sorry. I just had to yeah. say that. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, oh, okay. but. What I realized recently was that this that's not true now. Now you have teenagers that have lost friends to suicide because it is more on the uptick, if you will. And it was just like, oh my gosh, it becomes even more important that we have these conversations with our teenagers, with our children and saying, Hey, I've noticed that you've been really distant lately. Tell me what's up. You know, what's going on? And they may or may not open up to you. But again, just having that conversation with them, be willing to have the conversation with them because right. it's so easy to be like, oh, not my kid. No, my <laughs> kid's good, <laughs> you know, but it's often the most you know, the most saddest words that you will ever hear is we had no idea. Right. And I think that we, we, you, we can vilify social media or we can celebrate it. I like to decide to do both. Um, but with social media, they do encounter more experiences with people committing suicide or losing their life. I think that giving a little bit of credit for the overall media, whether it's you know, print, radio, uh, TV, or online, where they talk about people dying of suicide, where in the past it would be that someone died tragically. And the only people who died of suicide were like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a name. When I grew up was Kurt Cobain. That was the only one they really talked about openly, how he passed away. But now it's kind of like all over the place. And in some ways, social media may have helped kind of lift a little bit of that stigma and be able to talk about it so that teenagers are aware. And then us as parents, as people, frankly, I say parents, but frankly, people, I'm, I mean, we need to be able to talk about it. too. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like the idea that you bring up Kurt Cobain because again, I just naturally assuming that and remembering like, yeah, you're right. I don't recall any other you know, even if it's a celebrity, but I don't recall ever just having that specific conversation. Like this person died by suicide. It was like, oh, okay. Because it just wasn't talked about. And again, there's no right or wrong. It was just how it was. And, but now that we're seeing this dramatic uptick, it's, we need to start having that conversation and not be not be fearful about it. And yes, it's going to be uncomfortable, but would you rather the alternative? 
No, yeah, exactly. It was you took the words out of my mouth, and it's one of those things that I feel like, no matter what you feel about the pandemic, it has created more social isolation in general, and feeling alone. And unfortunately, we've polarized ourselves. You know, you're against blank or you're for blank. I'm just not getting into that that debate right now. And so I think that because of increased isolation, I think suicide has increased overall. And I think that we need to be able to talk about it. This is not over. We're even if the pandemic tomorrow miraculously was done and you know, tomorrow, I still think that we're going to deal with the ramification for years to come. And that includes suicidal thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because we we've been talking for about an hour already. And we flew by, you know, first of all, I want to thank you because I know you said you mentioned me in uh, some work that you had written. So I do want to thank you for that. But I, I think that a lot of people will want to communicate with you and talk about you. So tell me a little bit about how we can reach you and how, you know, how are you presenting in this world right now? Thank you. Yeah. And my pleasure, Steve. I'm, I'm happy to support you in any way that I can. And, and I know that it'll be reciprocated, but you can find me, my social media at scatteringhope.com, my website or across social media at Scattering Hope, as well as the sister company that I started in my sister's memory is Owl and Thistle and same thing, owlandthistle.com and across social media, Owl and Thistle. And the goal, the mission behind Alan Thistle is to do exactly what we've been talking about here on the end of our conversation. And that is allowing people the space to have that conversation, but also to let people know in our life how much they are loved. Well, I went to your website and, you know, there's a subscription box, I believe. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. Yeah. So like I was just mentioning, both both parties, both uh, companies have their distinct flavor, if you will. The Scattered Hope focuses on helping families heal after losing a loved one to suicide. And the sister company, Alan Thistle, is focused on suicide prevention and letting people know how much they are loved. And so each subscription has different products inside that are, of course, tailored to whether it's healing after the suicide loss or allowing people the opportunity to have that conversation with our loved ones and saying, hey, you know what, I see you. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm thinking about you and, and I love you. And just opening up that conversation and having that dialogue in both subscription boxes allow someone to do that. Well, I think it's a brilliant idea, first of all. You know, oh, when, I, when you. I saw that, it was a great idea. And I can't thank you enough, you know, not only for today, but for what I consider a good friendship. Since we started knowing each other, it's been, we've had hard conversations. You know, I wanted to kind of like share that when we were in San Diego, we started having a conversation a little bit about your sister. It was a little hard and you had to walk away, which is very much fine. But sometimes you meet people in your life that, you you know, we're geographically far, far from each other. I mean, and you meet someone and you just kind of like feel like you know them and you feel really close to them. So I can't thank you enough for what I consider a good friendship so far and really sharing your story so openly everywhere I've met you. I think it's going to open a lot of minds. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Steve. And I've really enjoyed our our blossoming friendship as well. I, I know that the universe works in magical ways and it was interesting that you brought up San Diego because I think both of us, you know, neither one of us had any idea that we were going to be in San Diego at that same time, let alone be able to meet each other face to face. So it was definitely one of those moments where it was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. What a small world that we were able to 
correspond with each other right before and then unknowingly meet each other face to face in San Diego. It was such a beautiful moment. So thank you. It was funny because I'm like, I was sitting in the other table. You were sitting at the other table and I heard your name. That's Crystal. I'm pretty sure. And I kind of brought it up and you're like, yeah, that, oh, and then we had that connection. It was just an awesome moment that I will cherish for a long time because it's always those things that mean the most, I think, in life. It's those accidental moments, not the ones you planned. Yes, absolutely. And and just like we were talking about throughout this whole conversation is that there's going to be people that you meet that you had no idea that you can help and support down the road. And it's just be open. And, and I'm so grateful that I got the chance to meet you. Well, and I, I know that you're working on a podcast eventually. I know that dealing with pregnancy and starting a podcast can be sometimes very difficult, but you know, if you ever ha- want a guest on, it will be my pleasure to be on with you. Absolutely. Yes. I'd love to have you. So I thank you very much for your time. And we'll, I know we will talk soon. I'm, I know we will too. Thank you. Well, that concludes episode 34 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Crystal Partney, thank you so much. You will find all in my show notes how to reach Crystal, and I hope you do. Such a powerful story. I was touched by so many parts of it. I had a tear in my eye a couple of times. I know that Crystal had tears in her eyes talking about her sister and other stuff that goes with that. So I hope that you've enjoyed this interview as much as I did because it was probably one of the most powerful ones of season three. So I hope you enjoy it. Episode 35 will be with Kristen Nazaro. Kristen is from mindthrivedigital.com and she helps mental health counselors get the SEO and the clients that they are seeking the most. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. I've known Kristen for a few months now. We've been exchanging and we've actually had a few meetings prior to this. So hopefully that shows up in the interview. Please like, subscribe or follow this podcast on your favorite platform a glowing review is always helpful and as a reminder this podcast is for information educational and entertainment purposes if you are struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue please reach out to a professional counselor or therapist for consultation